All right. Hello, hello, hello. Awesome. Uh, so we actually we have a pretty good sample size here. So I'm actually curious, just by a show of hands, who here is familiar with uh, the concept of decentralized exchange? Yes, that's awesome. All right. And and how many people here trade on a decentralized exchange? All right. All right. How many people here trade on a decentralized exchange but don't trade on a centralized exchange? <laughs> All right. All right, one more question. Who here works for a centralized exchange? All right. Okay, uh, so today I'm going to be going over at sort of like a high level our thoughts about decentralized exchange at 0x. Uh, so it sounds like everyone is really familiar with this already, so maybe we'll just maybe, you know, paint a different picture of it for you guys. See, see decentralized exchange through our eyes. <laughs> so typically when you're talking about value on the blockchain, people are referring to cryptocurrency. Right? But the blockchain can represent lots of different forms of value. It can represent tangible value, like a house, a car, or a collectible. Reputation, my rights, or my time. Or it can represent access to services or the ability to participate in some economy. And when we talk about the flow of value, we're talking about accessible value. So when value is accessible, it can flow freely from one form to another. My time becomes tangible when I exchange my labor for a car. This car, in turn, becomes utility when I exchange it for money and can now participate in some economy. Tokenization allows us to encapsulate this value. So on Ethereum, our tokens encapsulate my ownership over some uh, security, like real estate. And the 0x token encapsulates my right to participate in governance on the 0x protocol. And the GNT token encapsulates my ability to compute on the Golem network. And then ERC-20 provides a common interface to all of these tokens. So combined encapsulation and common interfaces make it really easy to exchange this value and let it flow throughout the network. The problem is that in the current landscape, we have several disjoint blockchains. And as a result of this, the value too is fragmented. So the question now becomes, if value needs to flow, how can we enable it to flow between platforms, between chains? So if we have tokens on Definity and tokens on Ethereum, how can we allow them to flow from one to the other? So to sort of formulize, formalize this problem, value must be accessible in order for it to flow. However, most valuable is not accessible in a trustless way. And we need a way to bridge these silos. Nice. Uh, so right now, uh, the most common bridge would be a centralized exchange. So everyone here knows what decentralized exchange is, so I assume everyone here is trade on centralized exchange. We all know that there's some trusted escrow that we're going to deposit our funds into, and we're going to hopefully withdraw them after we're finished trading. Of course, there's a lot of risk associated with this design. Number one, trust. So everyone is probably familiar, has heard from one time or another about a, a centralized exchange being hacked. Um, but something a little bit more subtle is that when you deposit your funds into this escrow, you're not just handing over control of your assets, you're also relinquishing your rights and ownership over the underlying value. So what happens when this underlying value is not just a cryptocurrency, but it's something intrinsic, like the right to vote? So an example of this is earlier this year, some exchanges used user-deposited funds to help activate the EOS network. And there's nothing inherently wrong with this. The people are holding these EOS tokens. Supposedly, they want this activation to go through. But it sort of alludes to a much broader problem, which is that if there is a conflict of interest, you've handed over all of the power to this exchange, and they're free to do whatever they want. Uh, the second is censorship. So uh, because we have a centralized exchange, we also have a central point of failure. So access to this exchange can be blocked. They can also force, an oppressive government can also force them to lock a specific user's funds, or the assets of that exchange can in turn be locked by, that, by their financial service providers. So when you put trust in a centralized exchange, you're not only trusting them, but you're also trusting all of the parties that they rely on as well. Uh, it's important to note here that censorship does not equal compliance, so it is important to remain compliant. What, what, uh, what we disagree with is when this censorship conflicts with your rights. So a well-documented example of this is back in 2017, Bank of America, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, all censored WikiLeaks access to their financial services. Now, as a result, WikiLeaks had to accept donations in Bitcoin, so it wasn't that bad, but still. 
And finally, uh, transparency. So if we break down the components of an exchange, the first is price discovery. How do I value my asset? The second, party matching. Who am I going to exchange this asset with? And thirdly, trade execution, where we actually swap assets. So when you're trading on a centralized exchange, this is all one big black, big black box. Big black box, yeah. Uh, which is just as hard to see into as it is to say. And what this allows them to do is manipulate markets very, very easily. The most common way to do this is to falsify volume. So the motivation on the outside to falsify your volume is to make your exchange look bigger, maybe get a higher ranking on coin market cap or something. But this also has a huge impact on traders because if I go to an exchange and I see an order book that looks really deep and I do a market buy, the slippage when there's falsified volume is actually gonna be a lot bigger than if the volume were legit. So enter decentralized exchange. Um, the way that we define it at 0x is a trustless peer-to-peer -peer exchange of value where parties retain ownership of their assets through to settlement. So if we break this definition down, trustless, because I'm trading directly with my counterparty and there's no trusted intermediary, we can say that this system is trustless. And because it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's in incredibly difficult to censor. And because the logic for this exchange is baked into a publicly available smart contract, it's completely transparent. Anybody can audit this. So we've created a system that is trustless, censorship resistant, and transparent. But decentralized exchange goes one step further. We allow you to do things that you can't do on a centralized exchange. So the first, programmability. So traditionally, applications have to separate their business logic from the logic that interacts with value. So if you look at eBay, they have this entire marketplace, uh, which is the core of their infrastructure, but then when it comes to settlement, they're gonna offload that to something like PayPal. Now, you can embed the application logic and the value exchange together. One example of how our token does this on Ethereum is that they can actually run compliance checks and check the recipient of a trade uh, during execution and then cancel that trade partway through. The second, atomicity. So the, this is by far my favorite one. So uh, to be atomic means that a sequence of operations are either all gonna occur or none of them will happen. So with decentralized exchange, this allows me to make a series of trades on different DEXs and either I'll come out in the green or none of these trades will be executed, which is super cool. Another thing you can do is margin trade with zero risk. So in this single transaction, I could borrow funds, use them to trade on different exchanges, return them to the lender, all in a single atomic transaction. Uh, and thirdly, global markets. So a lot of centralized marketplaces are also segregated geographically. The one that most people are probably familiar with, the uh, South Korean exchanges. So during the ICO craze of 2017, Bitcoin was trading 40% higher in South Korea than it was here in the US. And we couldn't take advantage of that unless you had access to their traditional financial system. So one way to resolve this would have been to spin up a DEX, which has very low overhead, peg the US dollar to some tether token, peg the Korean won to some tether token, and now you have complete access to that marketplace. So by commoditizing exchanges, we're making it a lot faster to spin these up and, uh, and access either existing markets that are currently segregated or new markets that are underserved. Okay, the missing piece, blockchain interoperability. So the big limitation that we're facing right now is that we're limited to exchanging tokens that exists on the blockchain, the same blockchain as our DEX. So if we're running on Ethereum, then we're limited to trading the types of assets that can be shown on Ethereum, ERC-20, ERC-721, etc. cetera. Uh, so we need to find a trustless way to transfer this value between chains. So a few different things that we've looked at. The most common way to do this is through pegged assets. So it's taking an ERC-20 token and pegging it to the value of one Bitcoin. And the most common way to do this is to issue IOUs. So you're gonna deposit a bunch of Bitcoin into some escrow that's probably run by a single operator and then mint new ERC-20 tokens and trade against those. Another way you can do this, what DAI does, is you can actually peg it to the exchange rate of Ethereum and Bitcoin. So right now DAI is pegged to uh, the US dollar, but you could imagine a similar system that is pegged to the exchange rate of Ethereum and Bitcoin. The problem with both of these approaches that we're facing is that 
the pegs do not actually provide you any ownership of the underlying value. So if I'm pegged to the US dollar, I don't actually own a US dollar if I'm holding that token. Or if I'm pegged to Bitcoin, I have an IOU or I have uh, enough ether to maybe buy a Bitcoin. But I don't actually have the underlying asset. Another approach is atomic swaps. So in this case, you're going to have like an ether and one Bitcoin that are swapped in unison during the trade. The problem that we face here is that it's expensive because you have to have settlement on multiple chains and it tends to be rate limited by the slowest chain. So if, if one chain, especially in the, the ones with probabilistic finality, if you have to wait you know, 30, 40 minutes for this to go through, it's not going to be a very good user experience on a DEX. Um, you also often end up with this thing called the free option where the last trader to sign off on this swap can essentially just wait until the last minute and if the exchange rate doesn't move in their favor during the time of this atomic swap, then they can just cancel it. So it's not, not very fair. Uh, and the state channels, state channels is a way to make this process faster so you can move these to just on, uh, off-chain transactions that you sign and send between one another. Um, a few problems we face here is that generally these state channels are custodial. So when you're trading on the Xerox protocol, I'm trading directly with my counterparty. The idea is that I don't have to relinquish uh, control of my asset. Um, and also, more, moreover, the, the parties have to be online during the settlement phase, which makes it really hard to like, create limit orders and stuff like that. So to sort of summarize, we, we know that tokenization, right, as it stands now, with uh, you know, ERC-20, ERC-721 tokens, it's, there are tons and tons of new verticals that are gonna unlock in the upcoming years. Areas like securities, collectibles, and as new blockchains spin up, it's also gonna open up new opportunities for tokenization. Decentralization or decentralized exchange between these blockchains is gonna become really imperative and we need to figure out a way to do trustless interoperability between the two. Uh, these three combined empower value to flow freely and are gonna play a huge role in the decentralized financial system of tomorrow. Cool, oh, thanks. Yeah. Oh yeah, questions? Uh, hi there, so I'm an early investor in like, Xerox, and um, it's a pretty cool like, protocol, but uh, my biggest question right now is like, the Xerox token is just a governance token, and how we can actually increase the utility of that? Um, so that's my first question. And my second question is, uh, so I've made investment in other um, DAX built on top of like, Xerox as well, say for instance like DDAX, and um, they have a pretty, so I think that's already like the best like consumer experience um, like DAX already, but the, but like they still have like problems just like bootstrap their so their like uh, current liquidity, and so as like, a consumer, so it's very hard to use like DAX now, and so like um, anything that you can think about to just fix that, and also just to add on uh, what is like, the biggest risk for centralized exchange because I um, know like all this like you know like this like, bad door story. The, like the biggest risk right now is actually exchange rollback. Um, like all this, like, so, um, uh, so if you remember like OKEX, so they actually roll back the transaction. Uh, that's never happened before, like even for NASDAQ and like um, NYSE, like in their like hundreds of years of like history. So that's actually the biggest like, counterparty risk. Uh, if we, so if we want to bring on more traders uh, onto centralized exchange. Um, okay. Question. Okay, okay, I, I think I got it. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna go backwards from there, or order of memory. Um, so yeah, actually we, we even saw that last year when uh, I think it was Bitcoin Cash was uh, ac accidentally maybe released on Coinbase a little bit too soon and lots of trades went through, they ended up rolling those back. This is also a really, really huge problem uh, just in the general financial system where there is actually no finality. So when they're trading between banks, for example, they're trading purely with IOUs and a transaction can be rolled back at any time. Definitely, definitely a big problem. Um, in terms of uh, the zero X token, uh, so that's going to be used. Anyone who's familiar with the project has heard this is going to be used for governance. We recently hired a governance researcher, and we're focusing on how we can bring utility to this token. And ultimately, we want to, in stages, hand over control of the zero X protocol to the community. And the way that we're planning to do this first, initially, is by creating a community a community driven fund that is gonna be completely run by staking your Xerox tokens. Um, and then the third question, I forget what that was. Uh, so how to bootstrap. Uh, oh yeah, bootstrapping yeah. liquidity, yeah. So that's another thing. Um, 
right now, I believe a lot of the relayers and a lot of DEXs are doing their own sort of market making strategies and being able to do this, it, this. We have folks on our team who are definitely focused on helping bootstrap this liquidity. And one of our questions around the Xerox token is how we can use this to also help make market makers, you know, successful on the Xerox network. But all of this is super early stage. Yeah. Cool. Thanks very much, Greg. All right. Thanks, guys.